so I'll be talking about uh, C-based application exploits and uh, mitigations against these exploits. Um, so what we'll look at is um, basically vulnerabilities that exist in uh, C-based programs that could allow an attacker to inject code into the uh, application and uh, execute that code. Uh, so these allow an attacker to execute uh, code that's not normally part of the program with the permissions of the, uh, of the program that the program is running at. So this is a major problem for programs written in C, C++, and uh, as well as Objective-C. So we'll look at how these um, code injection errors work, uh, attacks work, and then we'll look at countermeasures that make it harder for an attacker to, to exploit these. Uh, so we'll start with um, memory management in, in C-based languages. We'll, we'll have a quick overview of how memory management works in these languages. Then we'll look at uh, specific vulnerabilities, mitigations, and then we're done. So uh, memory is allocated in multiple ways in C-based languages. Um, so there's automatic allocation. That's local variables in a function. When, when you say int i, that's the, the compiler will automatically allocate that memory for you, and you, you're able to use that. Or if you declare an array in a local function, you don't have to worry about cleaning up. Then you have uh, static and global variables. So uh, global variables that you declare, they, they live for the entire length of the program, and they're uh, released when the program is finished. And then there's um, dynamic memory, which uh, the, the, the a programmer is, is responsible for, for, for managing himself. So you have to malloc memory to be able to fill it, and then you have to free it yourself and things like that. Um, so a programmer is responsible for the managing of dynamic memory, but he's also uh, responsible for appropriate use of memory. So if you write too many bytes in, uh, in, an, in an array, you'll have a buffer overflow, and that's a problem. He's also responsible for type checks to ensure that, that uh, that the, the correct type is used as well. So um, as we all know, uh, memory management is very error prone. So it's very easy to make a mistake uh, against this. So a typical bug is uh, if you write past the bounds of, uh, of allocated memory, uh, which is a buffer overflow. Uh, another one is, is a dangling pointer reference. It's a pointer to, to, to memory that has already been freed that you're still using as valid memory. Uh, a double free, which is basically uh, a specialized version of a dangling pointer. We'll look at that specifically because it has a specific way of exploiting it. This happens when you, you freed memory, but you still have the pointer and you free it again. So you're misusing a dangling pointer. Uh, memory leaks, which aren't uh, the focus of this presentation, but they're also a typical error, uh, happens when you don't deallocate memory and your program keeps on using more and more memory. So uh, C, like compilers, will not check uh, or detect these bugs at runtime because uh, it would take too much time and it would impact efficiency. Um, so what the C standard specifically says is that these uh, errors are, are, are not, are undefined. So if, if you write too many uh, uh, bytes into, into an array, the C standard says uh, what happens next is undefined. That means a compiler can decide what to do uh, when this occurs. So if we look at a uh, typical uh, uh, process memory layout, uh, this is for Linux, uh, which we'll be using uh, as our example setting. Uh, we'll discuss mitigations for other operating systems as well, but, but when, when looking at, at specifically how to exploit these uh, for the hands-on and for this, we'll, we'll, we'll look at Linux, uh, Linux type environments. So typical memory layout for Linux, uh, Linux type environments is that you have your arguments environment at the top of, uh, of memory, so at the three, three gigabytes here in a, in a typical system without any mitigations. And uh, below that, you have the start of your stack where all your local variables are stored, which grows down. Uh, by default, it's a maximum of eight megabytes, but you can enlarge that uh, in, in Linux systems. And then uh, you have the heap, uh, which grows up uh, towards the stack and the stack, which grows down towards the heap. And in between, you have some shared memory that you can use when, 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 uh, when running multiple processes that, that need to share memory. Below the heap, you have uh, static and global data. Yeah. Uh, so below the heap, you have static and global data, uh, which is, uh, as we discussed, 
uh, data that lives for the entirety of the program, and below that you have program code, uh, which you can't write to by default. So that was a quick overview of, uh, of uh, memory management. So now let's, uh, let's start looking at, at specific uh, vulnerabilities and, and how they work. Uh, so we'll start with looking at what code injection attacks are. Um, uh, so how they work specifically, and then move on to, 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 to three important uh, C-based vulnerabilities. So a code injection attack uh, occurs when uh, an attacker has an, has, uh, tries to exploit one of these errors. So there is a number of preconditions that are required to exploit a vulnerability and execute code. So an, an attacker has to do a number of things. He has to find a bug that can allow him to write, overwrite an interesting memory location. We'll see in a second what an interesting memory location is. Um, so yeah, a buffer overflow would be this type of bug. He has to uh, find an interesting memory location. Uh, that's not too hard. And then he has to copy his code uh, in binary form into the program. Uh, this is also quite easy. Uh, you just give it as input to the program if you're allowed to specify the input to the program. And then use that vulnerability to modify the interesting memory location to, prog to, to point to your target code and then execute that target code. Uh, this is the, the main difficulty, I guess, for, for an attacker. Well, this and finding that bug. So what are interesting uh, memory locations? Um, any stored code address, which if modified means that when, code, uh, when that stored code address is, is reused to, to continue execution, for example, um, when that's loaded into the program counter, your, your, your code will be executed. Uh, so IP is instruction pointer in this case. Um, so yes, uh, examples are the return address, the typical uh, target for attackers. Uh, that's the address where, where the uh, execution must continue when, when a function call has finished. Uh, the global offset table is, is another one. Um, so that's used for, to dynamically load, load functions. So you'll have a table where, where there's pointers to the functions that you've loaded so that when, once they're loaded into memory, uh, you can access them directly while, while uh, if you access them the first time, it will have uh, a stop code that will load the, the code into memory. Now, if you overwrite that pointer, of course, when that function is executed, your, your code will be executed rather than the function uh, that was originally intended. Uh, the virtual function table, uh, which is used for dynamic binding in C++, can also be overwritten so that when uh, one of these uh, dynamically bound functions is called, uh, your code will be executed rather than the, the original one. And uh, detours functions are interesting uh, because those are functions, destructor functions. Those are called when the program exits. And uh, so while it might take, take a while for it to exit, uh, it might be useful if you can't overwrite any of the others and get an immediate result. So more interesting memory allocations are function pointers, of course, uh, which when modified uh, will call your code rather than the, the function that it was pointing to. Data pointers are also interesting uh, memory locations because you can use them for indirect pointer overwriting, which we'll see in a second uh, how to do that. So, uh, but quick basic uh, idea behind this is to make, your, make that data pointer point to an interesting memory location. Now when that pointer is dereferenced for <coughs> writing, the uh, memory location will be, will be overwritten. So uh, if an attacker can overwrite uh, any of these locations, uh, well, except a data pointer, uh, which requires some more work, but uh, for any of the other locations, they'll have immediate, almost immediate code execution. So um, let's move on to the um, most famous type of, of attack for, for this type of, uh, of languages, the buffer overflow. So we'll start with uh, the typical stack-based buffer overflows, which uh, were most occurring uh, in the last, well, <laughs> which are the most occurring type of buffer overflow even today. Uh, indirect pointer overwriting um, is a way of exploiting, uh, uh, exploiting these vulnerabilities when, when you can't overwrite as much as you'd like. Then heap-based buffer overflows and double freeze are, are, uh, are another type of, of error. And then we'll look at uh, overflows in other segments as well. So what's the, what, what has the impact been of buffer overflow? So why, why is this important? Uh, so if we look at, at, at a number of, uh, of vulnerabilities that have, uh, or a number of worms and things like that that 
have exploited buffer overflows, they've caused massive, uh, massive issues. So Code Red Worm caused an estimated $2.6 billion loss uh, worldwide uh, during, its, during its span. Uh, the Sasser Worm uh, shut down uh, X-ray machines at, at a Swedish hospital and caused uh, Delta Airlines to, to cancel several transatlantic flights because their computers were infected and they couldn't use them anymore. Uh, the Zotop Worm, another one, um, uh, caused the, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, so U.S. visit is uh, the visa waiver program that Europeans use to visit the U.S. So uh, these computers crashed, which meant uh, you can get into the country because you had to wait until they were back up. And then, of course, Stuxnet, Stuxnet which was in news recently, one of the vulnerabilities that it used was also a buffer overflow. Um, so yeah, these were all, all the four worms used uh, stack-based buffer overflows in, in, in some sense. And here are the specific uh, Microsoft uh, identifiers for these bugs. Um, yeah, ignore this because my talk was last night, not this night. But uh, so the numbers, uh, if you look at the National Institute for Vulnerability, uh, so National Institute for Standards and Technology, their National Vulnerability Database, uh, we see that over the last 25 years, uh, we had 7,809 buffer overflows reported, which is 40% of all vulnerabilities, and it's the most occurring vulnerability. Uh, Cross-site scripting was second place with uh, 7,006 vulnerabilities. But uh, if we look further, what we see is that uh, it's the most occurring for high severity vulnerabilities and the most occurring for critical vulnerabilities as well. Cross-site scripting only has 141 uh, high severity vulnerabilities. So, um, yes, it's an important vulnerability still today. So it was the most occurring vulnerability in 2011 and second most important in 2012. And it was in the top three every year except for 2005, for the last 25 years. So what is it exactly? Uh, so a quick definition is that writing beyond the bounds of an array and overwriting information that's stored behind that array. That array can either be uh, accessed via an index or via pointer to that array. Um, most types of buffer overflows occur uh, due to uh, access via pointer rather than, than index uh, accesses. Um, Java is not vulnerable because it doesn't allow programmers to do pointer arithmetic and it will check array indexing. Uh, array index checking is actually a, a very cheap operation. You could do that in C, but since most of overflows occur uh, due, to, due to pointer accesses, it's not, it's not as easy. Um, so how do they occur? Uh, they occur because of uh, unsafe copying functions. So for example, uh, string copy is a, is a typical one. So where you copy one string to another string and you don't do any size checks, that's a, that's a typical one. Uh, another one is when you loop over an array and this is an index access problem, uh, using an index which might be too high. So um, well, the C standard allows you to create uh, an index that's one out of bounds for an array, you're not allowed to write to it. So if, you're, if your loop miscalculates by one and you write to that array, you can, you can have an off by one error, which, uh, uh, you can have an off by one error, which is a buffer overflow, uh, and you might overwrite something uh, interesting that's stored behind there. And integer errors are, are also uh, a big source of buffer overflows. Uh, we'll see integer errors specifically in their own category later, but they usually cause buffer overflows. Uh, so how can you prevent uh, buffer overflow? Um, basically using copying functions, uh, which allow a programmer to specify a maximum uh, size to copy. So for, bank, for example, strn copy or strl copy are, are typical, uh, typical ones. Um, checking index values better. Uh, yeah, that's a fairly simple one, of course. Uh, making sure that you terminate your, your array on time and uh, better checks on, on, on integers. So if we look at a short example uh, of a buffer overflow, what we see here is um, we, de we declare uh, an array of characters which is 80 large, and we copy what's whatever's provided as input into that array. That input is provided by the first argument to the program, 
And so whatever, if we, if we uh, supply more than 80 bytes, this will overflow and whatever is stored behind that array will be over it. So to be able to execute code, what an attacker needs is uh, shell code. Uh, so that's a small program in, uh, in uh, machine code representation. And it's injected into the address space of the process. And then uh, when, whenever the code jumps there, it just executes it. So for example, this program, which prints you win and then exits, uh, which we'll be using in the hands-on session uh, after this, um, looks like this in shell code. So this is just, uh, just binary, just machine code representation of that program. So uh, this CD80, for example, is, is, an, uh, is, is int 80, the, the assembler instruction to, call a, to, to, to execute a system call, for example. So, now that we have an idea of how buffer overflows in general work, let's look at specific ones and how to exploit them. So, uh, the stack is used at runtime to manage uh, local information for a program. Um, so, for every function call, a new record is created, and in, and in that record, we have the return address for the function. So, that's where the uh, computer must, must continue execution once the function has finished. Um, the arguments passed to the function and local var variables for that function. So if an attacker can overflow a local variable, he'll have an interesting location nearby, the return address. Now, there's also um, ways of exploiting buffer overflows which do not require um, exploiting, uh, overwriting the return address, for example. You can overwrite other data. So. This is a, a, a shortened version of the old Linux uh, login vulnerability. So what we see here is uh, we have uh, three, array of three areas of characters. They're all eight large. Uh, we print login. We get the username. We look up the username. Uh, we look up the hash password for that username. We ask for the password. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll get it from the user. And then we'll check if the hash uh, password that we looked up is the same as the hash of that password that we just entered. If it is, that's fine, you can log in, otherwise we'll return invalid. So if we look at this program, uh, how this looks on the stack, what we'll see is this. So we'll we use this uh, representation for, for every, everything in this, uh, in this presentation. So this typical uh, layout here. So the stack grows from up to down here. This is the instruction pointer, so we're where our executing code is pointing to, the frame pointer, uh, which is used to access local variables, and the stack pointer, which moves whenever we put something on the stack or take something off it. So what we see is we have, we've declared eight, uh, oh, sorry, three um, arrays of eight characters. So we'll have them stored here. We'll have the user, the hash, and the password. They're stored in the order that they were uh, declared here. So what happens now? Uh, when we ask for the user, so get us user writes the username here, that's fine. Look up hash, fills in the hash here, and uh, ask for the password, fills in the password here. So, um, how would we exploit this? Anybody have an idea? Not you. Exactly. Yep. So the attacker can specify a password that's longer than eight characters, and he'll overwrite the hash password. So if, if uh, for example, the attacker enters AAA, BBBB, and where BBBB is the hash password of AAA, uh, what will happen is he'll have overwritten both the hash and his own, and, and, uh, and he'll have written the password. So uh, he can log into any user account without knowing the password by, by, by just uh, overwriting it. Uh, this is also called a non-control data attack because he didn't actually have to inject code and or modify the control flow of the program. He used the existing control flow but just modified the, the behavior by modifying the data. So yeah, this is what it looks like. So he'll have the password here, he'll have overwritten the hash 
and then when the equals check hap happens, it'll just bypass this. So what does a typical uh, buffer overflow look like? So that was, that was the simple case. Uh, this uh, doesn't always, uh, always occur. Uh, you can't always overwrite something that's local to the function that might, might, uh, might help you bypass uh, security. So in a typical uh, buffer overflow, what we have is uh, here we'll, what we'll use as, uh, is this example in, in many of our cases. So we'll have a function f0, which does a call to f1. In f1, we'll have a locally declared buffer. It'll overflow. And then uh, this is what the stack will look like. So for our f0, we have a return address for f0 on the stack. We'll have the same pr safe frame pointer for f0 on the stack. Uh, and then we'll have local variables for f0. Then when the call to f1 occurs, the, um, we'll put the arguments for f1 on the stack. And then when we enter f1, what will happen is we'll have the return address, which points to the next instruction after the call to f1. We'll, have, we'll, we'll create a safe frame pointer. So basically what we'll do is we'll save the frame pointer at that time here. Uh, and then we'll point the frame pointer here. So then when we, we, we release the function, we can just uh, put this frame pointer back here and then it'll point here again. So that, that's an easy way to clear the stack. Uh, it's a typical trick used by compilers. So and then we have the locally declared buffer which is below the safe frame pointer and then uh, that, that's what it looks like. So when an overflow occurs, uh, the attacker, because he's, he's able to write to buffer because he's causing the overflow, he'll put, in this case, he'll have put his injected code into buffer He'll overflow the safe frame pointer. He doesn't care because he's never returning from the function anyway. He'll overwrite the return address. And so when the function tries to return, it'll execute his injected code rather than the instruction after the call to F F1. And then, so after the function returns, the instruction pointer will point here. And the frame pointer will point to garbage. Uh, so we'll look at a few uh, small exercises now. Um, we'll go into much more detail in, in the hands-on session uh, on, these, uh, on these examples. So we'll use Gara's Insecure Programming page, which has a bunch of examples uh, of insecure uh, C programs. And uh, we'll solve them in the hands-on, and, and now we'll look at some of them. So for the following programs, uh, you can assume that it's a Linux on Intel 32-bit, so basically the architecture we've been using for the, for the entire presentation. So uh, I'll ask you to draw the stack layout right after getS has executed, and then ask you which input you would give to the program to make it print out you win. So this is a first example. Um, so what we have is a function in main. It has a local variable called cookie. It has a, a, a buffer of 80 characters. Uh, ignore this printf. You won't, you, you won't really need it for, for, this, uh, for this one. Then you'll do a get s of buff. And if the cookie is equal to 41, 42, 43, 44, um, so hex values, uh, you'll print out you win. So yeah, uh, if you have a pen and paper, maybe, uh, or your laptop, maybe you can, you can draw a quick, uh, you can draw quickly what you think would, 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 be, the, would be the result of this. And then uh, we, can see, we can see if you were, uh, if you got it or not.
So this is the program, because I'll, I'll switch to the stack layouts to make it a little bit easier. Uh, so kind of a drawing that, that shows basically what this looks like. Right? Um, so can, can anybody tell me what input you would give to this program to, uh, to get it to print out you win? Yep, exactly. So this is the stack layout that, that, that we would normally, that, that, that you should have drawn. Uh, so the return address here, frame pointer here, cookie here, and then buffer here. And so after the get s, uh, you'll write 80 characters to fill in the buffer. And then, uh, so 41, 42, 43, 44 is, uh, this is 41, but since it's uh, Intel 32-bit, uh, it's little, uh, little Indian, so, so we're going DCBA. So we have to put them in reverse. And then what we'll have here is ABCD that's written because it's considered an integer, it's stored in, uh, in reverse. And uh, so this is the first simple example that we'll be doing in the, in the hands-on, and then we'll be moving on to much more complicated ones. Okay, so how would we exploit this one? So again, you can draw the stack. Well, actually, you shouldn't need to draw the stack. It's the exact same one. But there's no if check and to print out, you win. So. Anybody have an idea of how to uh, exploit this one? I'll let you look for a, for a minute. Uh, so, so you can you can assume that um, that there's shellcode to print you win. Uh, well, you, you can pass it into into the the get s for buff. So so you can so you have the shell code, and you can just pass it in. So <coughs> how would you get it to print out you win? So you first insert the first part of the input is the, the shell code, mm -hmm. and then uh, twelve bytes of no eight bytes of something that doesn't matter, and then that address is stored there. Yeah, that. Uh, since this is the location of, of buffer, uh, so, and so we have this one again. Yeah, this example again. So this is our actual uh, uh, exploit code in this case. Um, so we have our, our address of buffer, which was on the slide. So this is where buffer is located. So we'll have a buffer of 93 characters. The last one is for the null byte. So um, what we'll do is we'll copy into buff, I, I filled buff with uh, 0x90s, which is an op instruction. Uh, so if we, if we happen to, to overwrite something uh, too much and we start executing that, it doesn't matter. But in this case, it's, uh, since we know the exact address of buff, it doesn't really matter in this case. So what we'll do is we'll copy our shell code into buff. Uh, and then at, at 88, so we have 88 bytes of, of nothing. We'll write four bytes of, for the return address. And then when we print this out and pass this as input to the program to get it to get us, we'll, uh, we'll execute our, our shell code, which prints out you win. So we'll be, so, so we'll be focusing much more on, uh, on, on these types of, of examples in, in the hands-on. Uh, they'll be a bit more complicated than this, but uh, these are just, an, uh, just some examples to, to, get you, uh, to get you started and to, to get you thinking about how, 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 how you would exploit these things. So yes, this is the graphical representation. So our injected code, Xerox 90s, uh, to overwrite cookie as well, to overwrite the safe frame pointer, and then, so that's why we need 88. So 80 for this, four for cookie, four for the safe frame pointer, and then finally we reach our target, which is a return address. Okay, so that's a simple stack-based buffer overflow. It's the typical one that uh, attackers use to exploit, but, um, there's much more complicated techniques as well. 
So indirect pointing over indirect pointer overwriting is, is a more more one of the more complicated techniques and um, what attackers do there is they overwrite uh, a target memory location by first overwriting a data pointer. So they make the data pointer point to their uh, target memory location, so for example the return address. And when that data pointer is dereferenced for writing, let's say you write a, a value that's controlled by the attacker, you'll then overwrite your target memory location and uh, uh, you'll, you'll have over it in your memory location and you'll be fine and you can execute your code later. So the reason for this is uh, this is used to bypass some of the defenses that we'll, talk, we'll be talking about later. Uh, so, yeah, so let's assume, so, so let's take a look at, at, at this example uh, first. So you have F0, which calls F1 again. Uh, so inside F0, we'll have return address for F0, say frame points for F0, lo local variables for F0 uh, stored on the stack. When, hmm. Okay, so assume, imagine that this arrow is a bit to the left. Uh, so what happens after the call to F1 has occurred? So our, our, we'll be pointing here with our instruction pointer because we just called F1. And the compiler will have filled in the return address for F1, which points to the next instruction after the call to F1. The save frame pointer for F1, we have a local variable which is a pointer which points to data here. This is random data somewhere in memory, we don't care. Uh, and then it will have a local variable called, called buffer. Um, so the buffer will overflow here and then we'll dereference pointer and we'll write value to it. Value is also attacker control. So in this case, we'll have our injected code in the buffer. We'll overwrite the full buffer and we'll overwrite the pointer. Let's assume in this case we cannot modify the safe frame pointer for some reason. Uh, we'll see later why we can. Uh, when, we, when we talk about defenses, but let's say we don't want to modify the, the safe frame pointer, there is no way to overwrite the return address otherwise uh, because a buffer overflow will keep on writing until it can reach its destination and if you, ca if you have to have a gap in between, you can't do that. So we'll overwrite our, our, uh, our pointer and we'll make it point to the return address. So now, instead of pointing to data, it'll point here. So now, when we dereference this pointer, it'll modify this, modify the return address, and since the attacker controls the value that's being written, he'll make it point to his injected code, and again, code will be executed. And then, he'll get to injected code. So, um, this is another small example. So we have a global uh, variable, integer vari variable, which is zero. Um, we have a pointer to that variable. So we have a local pointer to that variable. We have a buffer. And then we'll have uh, a getS of a buffer. And the first argument to the program will be written into this, uh, into A via the P B pointer here. So the attacker controls the argument to the program and he controls what's written to getS. So what would you uh, specify as input to this program to, to, to exploit it? So our buffer is at, at this location. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, then as, um, yeah, by in one pass the buffer, um, you write um, buffer plus 84, yes? So the other two plus buffer. Mm, that was 88. Yep. And then on um, the first argument, specify in hexadecimal notation the end of the book. Yep, that's right. So this is what the what the what the example program looks like on the on the stack. So um, 
in, will in be in the function main. We'll have the return address. We'll have the same frame, same frame pointer. We'll have the pointer B here, which points to A. We have our buffer here. And uh, yeah, that's what it looks like. So we have our, uh, we know that our return address is at 88. So buffer plus four for B plus four for say frame pointer. So at 88, we have the start of our return address. So we define our return address here as our buffers address plus 88. And then um, we'll write 84 bytes to the program. So we'll copy in our, our, our shell code. And then at byte 80, we'll write uh, our return address. So what will happen is we'll have our, our 80 bytes here, which contain our shell code. And, at, and here, we'll write, return, we'll write buffer plus 88, which is the start of our return address. So this will point here. And then, uh, so yeah, we can pass our, 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 our printf here as input into the program. And what we need to specify as, uh, as, our, as first argument is the, is the value to overwrite the return address with. So the, the start of the buffer in this case. So, so this is basically what it looks like. So we'll have overwritten buffer, over, have overwritten B, made the point to the return address, and then what we specify as argument one will overwrite the return address and make it point. So we'll have overwritten the return address in this case. Oh, yeah, we don't have the extra side. And then in the next step, uh, return address will execute our code here. So is uh, indirect pointer overwriting clear to everyone? Okay, because uh, E-based vulnerabilities are uh, kind of based on that, so. Um, so the heap contains dynamically allocated memory, so malloc new or alloc in Objective-C. Um, and, and a programmer has to manage it himself, so there's no garbage collection, there's nothing. So um, in, in some terminology here, so a part of the heap memory that's been processed by malloc, we call a chunk. So we'll be using chunks all over, so. Um, just a, a quick pointer here. Uh, so no return, there's no return addresses on, on the heap. So an attacker has to overwrite data pointers or function pointers if they're on the heap somewhere. So it's much harder to find interesting memory locations there. Now data and function pointers being on the heap can be very program specific. So for example, if you have an object, uh, which has local data pointers, you'll have them on the heap. If you, if you don't, you might not have them in the program or they might be very far from where your buffer flow occurs. So what attackers have found though is that most memory allocators store their man memory management information together with a chunk. This has changed in, in some of the more recent operating systems, uh, but this was the, generally the case uh, in, 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 the, in the early days and it's still the case in some memory allocators, for example, in the Linux one. So what you can do with an overflow instead of trying to find the data pointer or function pointer very program specific is you can overwrite the memory management information and have that do the work for you. So this is DL malloc. Uh, DL malloc is the memory allocator that the Linux memory allocator is based on. So DL malloc is Doug's leaves memory allocator. It's, a, it's a, a public domain memory allocator. And the one that Linux uses is called PT malloc and it's based on this one and it's just, uh, it does a lot more for, um, for threading. So, so it has much smaller locks than DL malloc, but that's, that's the main difference. It's, it's very similar. So, in, uh, so a chunk will look like this. So, so you'll, you'll have space for user data. So you've allocated 16 bytes. You'll get 16 bytes here and it'll add eight bytes. It'll store the size of the previous chunk I'll store the size of the current chunk, and, uh, and that's it. So, so that's what's stored there in a used chunk. So a chunk that's still in use that hasn't been passed to free. If you free a chunk, what will happen is uh, it can't automatically uh, re return it back to the system because the system expects uh, 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 the end of memory to, to, to go back or, 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 or if it's been mapped to, to have a whole, uh, a whole region to be returned. So what, what the memory allocator will, will do is it'll store a list of free chunks. It's doubly linked, so it'll have a pointer to the next one and a pointer to the previous one. So it'll overwrite the user data because it no longer needs it because it's been freed, so you're, you're free to overwrite it. So the first 16 bytes, uh, sorry, the first eight bytes of the old user data will contain a forward pointer and a backward pointer, and this will stay the same. 
Now, when you have two chunks that are freed and they're next to each other, of course you want to have a larger free chunk uh, since it's more versatile and, and let's say you have two 16 byte chunks that are free, then your next uh, allocation is for, for a 32 byte um, by chunk. Normally you can return the two 16 byte ones because they're, if they're not next to each other, but if they're next to each other, you can put them together into one larger one and then you can return that one to the, to the user. So what you, what basically what they do is uh, they, they remove the chunk from the doubly linked list and put it together. So uh, what it'll do, uh, this is the, the function that it uses. So what it'll do is it'll get the, the chunks back pointer and it'll get the chunks forward pointer and then it'll, check, it'll set the forward pointers, back pointers to the back pointer and the back pointers, forward pointer to the forward pointer. Uh, this is a little confusing when I explain it this way, but we'll, we'll have graphics in the, in the next slide. So basically, the pointers, forward pointers, backward pointers set to the pointers, backward pointer, the pointers, backward pointers, forward pointers set to the uh, forward pointer. So here's a graphical representation which makes it a, a little more uh, uh, accessible. So we have the size of the previous chunk here. So these are not necessarily uh, following each other in memory. So, so they can be anywhere in memory, these chunks. They're, they're just all free and uh, they're stored in the, in, the, in the doubly linked list. So chunk one's forward pointer points to chunk two. Chunk two's forward pointer points to chunk three. And then chunk three's backward pointer points back to chunk two and chunk two's backward pointer points to chunk one. So if we're anywhere in the list, we can move anywhere by, by following the forward or backward pointers, depending on what we want to do. So now let's remove chunk two from, from this list. So uh, chunk two's forward pointer points to, uh, chunk one's forward pointer points to chunk two and chunk three's forward backward pointer points to chunk two and we want to remove chunk two uh, from this list. So we'll do that based on the information that's in chunk two actually. So what we'll do is we'll set chunk two's forward pointer. So that's chunk two chunk three, that one's backward pointer will set to chunk two's backward pointer, which was pointing to chunk one. So this one will be set to, to chunk one based on the data that we have in chunk two. And then we'll do the same the other way around. So chunk two's backward pointer, that's chunk one. That one's forward pointer will be set to the backward pointer that we have here, which is chunk three. So this is a uh, a uh, typical way of, 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 uh, of, of freeing chunks or, or, or of removing them from the doubly linked list. Um, so now we'll look at what happens if we, have, uh, if we have a buffer overflow. So these are physically behind each other in memory. So this one's in use and this one's free. The in use one will now overflow the, the free one. And uh, so this is the in use one. Since we've been able to write to it, we'll write our injected code here. We've overwritten uh, chunk two with, uh, this doesn't really matter. So, so this has the size of the physically previous chunk as we saw earlier. So this is the size of chunk one here and size of chunk two doesn't really matter in, in, in our example case. It'll be, uh, it'll matter when we do the uh, heat based buffer overflow in the hands-on hands -on session. Uh, since, it's, uh, since it's very specific what you can enter and what you can't enter there. But for, for, for the basic concept, we, we don't really care about that. So we've overwritten uh, the forward pointer and we've made the forward pointer point to our return address and we've made the backward pointer point to our injected code. As we know, uh, when this gets unlinked, the forward pointers, backward pointer will be set to the backward pointer. So our return address uh, will be overwritten by the backward pointer, so it'll overwrite the injected code here. Uh, there's a, it'll be off by, by eight actually, but uh, so, so we'll actually point, to, point here in the normal case. Uh, but to get a graphical representation, I, I removed the, the, the complexities a bit. And we'll have our uh, return address point to our injected code after the unlink. Uh, and then, so when the function exits that we, f that the return address we've written for uh, exits, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get our code execution. This doesn't have to be a return address. Since, since we control the pointers, we can make them point anywhere in memory. I'm just using return address since we used it as our example in the previous case, but we can use any of the interesting memory locations we talked about. So uh, moving on to dangling pointer references. Uh, so these are pointers to, to memory that is no longer uh, allocated. Uh, so 
if you dereference a, a pointer that's, that's, that's been freed, that's not checked in C. Usually this leads to a crash, uh, um, but it can actually also result in, in code execution. So a typical one is uh, uh, a double free where, where, you where you free memory twice and you're able to overwrite the memory management information and you can uh, execute code in the same way as you do for, for, for a heap-based buffer overflow. Most ways of exploiting dangling pointer references uh, are very program specific. So uh, if you, if you uh, so if you have a pointer to memory that's been freed, you might be able to change the object type. You might be able to write a pointer somewhere where, where uh, the new object expects an integer, uh, and, but that actually modifies a pointer in the old object, but that's very program specific. So, what we're, so, so that's why we're focusing on double free here. So uh, we have our doubly linked list of, uh, of uh, free chunks. We'll have chunk two here. So chunk two is being freed in the regular way. It's been placed in the list at the top uh, before chunk three. So it's forward pointer is pointing to chunk three and chunk three's backward pointer is pointing to chunk th two. So what happens when we free chunk two again? So we'll put it at the front of the list. Uh, compiler doesn't, uh, the, the, the memory allocator doesn't know the difference. So it'll just say, okay, this is a, free, this is a chunk which was previously in use. I'll overwrite its, uh, its data here. I'll set its forward pointer to chunk two and I'll set this one that one's backward pointer to chunk two. Now, what this means is that what we'll actually have is chunk two's forward pointer will point to chunk two and chunk two's backward pointer will point to chunk two. So it'll point to itself in all cases. And uh, this is interesting because so yeah, it points to itself, but if you try to remove it from the list, it'll stay pointing to itself because the forward pointer's backward pointer, this one will be set to the forward pointer, which is chunk two. The forward pointer, uh, the backward pointer's forward pointer, uh, if you set that to the forward pointer, that's still chunk two. So you'll keep overwriting itself with itself and it's, it'll stay in there. Now, when you remove it from the list of free chunks, let's say to give it back to the program to, to use it, let's say you freed the chunk of 16 bytes twice, it'll be on the, on the stack and then you do a memory allocation of 16 bytes, you'll say, okay, I have one, it's at the top of the list, it's chunk two, I'll return chunk two. Now, as we saw earlier, this is the user data section. So from now on, the program can write forward and backward pointer and can store information there. And so what will happen is uh, the, the, the attacker can make the forward pointer and backward pointer point to wherever he wants. So he makes the forward pointer point to the return address and the backward pointers to the injected code. It's still in the list of free chunks, of course. Uh, because it's, 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 it's still the number one chunk. So it can be unlinked again. So, and when this happens now, when it's unlinked again, it'll, it'll, this will occur. So, so will, the overwrite will occur. So we'll, the forward pointer will be overwritten with the, with, the, with the backward pointer. So it'll make the backward pointer point our injected code uh, and so on. And so that's, that's how we exploit the double free, for example. So there's... Uh, Overflows in, in other segments as well, which, which are also interesting and which we'll also uh, go into more detail in, in the hands-on session. So the, the data segment uh, is, is, uh, is a segment of memory which contains a global and static uh, uh, compile time initialized data for the program. So if it's initialized at compile time, it'll be in the data segment. If it's not initialized at compile time, that means it's, it's, it should be zero when the program's loaded. That's stored in the BSS uh, segment. Uh, and an overflow in this segment can overwrite function and data pointer in the same segment or data in other segments. So we'll take a look at, at, at what a typical uh, layout looks like. So the data which contains compile time initialized uh, uh, variables will be stored here. It'll be followed by the constructor section, which is not that interesting because our program has already started up, so we can't do anything with the constructors. The destructors, however, uh, will execute when the program ends. So if we can overflow from here, we can overflow the detour section, which can cause uh, code execution and the program exit. Uh, we also have the global offset table, as you, as you might remember from, from the uh, beginning of the presentation. Global offset table contains, um, dynamic, uh, contains pointers used for dynamic linking. So if you can overflow these, you can, you can execute uh, 
you, you, you can execute code when, when that function that's dynamically linked gets loaded normally. And then we have the BSS segment and the heap uh, which follow. So if you have uh, an overflow in the BSS segment, you can't overflow any of these. So an overflow in the data segment is quite easy to exploit because you have all these here. An overflow in the BSS segment actually usually results in a, in a, in a kind of heap overflow. So in the sense that you overwrite the heap chunks here and then you use the unlinking uh, framework uh, to, to get it to, to execute your code. So here's an example of, uh, of an overflow in the, in the data segment. Uh, it's compile time initialized, that's why it's in the data segment. And basically we'll, we'll string copy uh, this into buffer. And uh, so this is what it'll look like. So we have our data here, which is our buffer of 256 characters. Uh, we'll have the constructors and we'll have the destructors here. So there's no destructors in this program. So this, the destructors will point to zero, which means it'll, it won't be used. Um, this, so this is an example of one of the advanced buffer overflows that we'll be exploiting in the, in the next section. So we know where the, we, we can look up via, via command line tools where the, where the detour section is relative to the buffer start. So we know that it's at, uh, at 476. So what we'll do is um, we'll overwrite this and at 472 is exactly where our destructor starts. And, uh, and we'll overwrite that pointer with, uh, with our buffer overflow. And so when the program exits, our code will be executed. Uh, so yeah, this is the graphical representation here. So we overwrite all this and then we get here and our code executes. So that's it for uh, buffer overflows. Um, format string vulnerabilities um, were, were discovered several years ago, 2001, I believe. So uh, they've been, they, they, were, they were popular around that time for a while. They, they've, they've been less popular these days because they're, they're fairly easy to spot in programs. Uh, you just have to, have to remember that you, you can't make these mistakes. Uh, but yeah, it's fairly easy to spot one if there is one. So a format string function is a, is a, format, uh, is a function that specifies, that, that, that you can use to specify formatting for output. So for example, the printf function, you, you say percentage %d is percentage %s and then you pass in an integer and a string. And so if, this, if the integer is 5 and the string says 5, it'll print out 5 is 5. So these functions take a variable number of, of arguments. Uh, which is interesting because uh, it doesn't know exactly how many arguments the program will have, so it just expects to find arguments on the stack whenever one is referenced here. Um, now, this is a problem when the attacker controls the format string. The format string. So if, if you just pass in whatever is passed in as input to printf, just to print it out, the, the attacker could, could pass in a percentage s or a percentage x and, and cause the program to, to do... Um, to misbehave. So you should always, if you want to print out input as it came in, you should always do printf percentage s input. So for example, let's say the attacker controls a format string. What happens uh, in, in this case if he, if he prints out, if he passes in percentage s, percentage x, percentage x? Um, so yeah, in this, this is, uh, so, so this is the stack layout we have. So we have our f0 here. We are our, our arguments to f1 that is that, that to, to printf that we that we expect here. So we we expect a format string, so this one, and uh, then above that we, we expect percentage s percent. Uh, so we expect these these uh, this data, but in this case all we all we've passed into the program is a format string. Uh, so we yeah, we'll have a return address for our say frame pointer here. So the attacker passes this in. It'll read one string and two integers from the stack in this case. So since we, we've passed only the format string, just input, which the attacker controls and, and has written this into it, it'll read actually the local variable of f0 as a string. It'll print that out. Then it'll read the uh, save frame pointer and it'll read the return address and it'll print all those out because the percentage x are the two integers that we're printing out as hexadecimal numbers. So in this case, uh, we'll have exploited the format string uh, vulnerability by, by, by just printing out data. So this is a more of an information leak uh, in this case, but interestingly enough, so yeah, this is what will be printed out. Interestingly enough, um, format strings can also write data, which is kind of weird. Uh, 
I don't know why they added this, but some, uh, some compilers have removed it. So percentage F will write the amount of data that's normal, that normally should have been written to the screen. It will write it to, an, to a pointer to an integer. Uh, so if you write percentage 200x, percentage n, it will write 200 to the integer that, that percentage n points to. Uh, so for example, Microsoft removed this from their compiler because this is adding this is kind of like inviting hackers to, 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 to exploit this, uh, this function. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you, you can, you can uh, your pointer to the target location can be somewhere on the stack, anywhere on the stack, because you can pop values until you reach it. And then you write to that location using the percentage n. So you can write a bunch of percentage x's and then percentage n to write a, a memory location. Um, we have a couple of examples of those in the, in the hands-on session, which, which delve into a lot more detail. So um, a look at integer errors. So there's two types of main integer errors, integer overflows and integer sinus errors. So an integer overflow occurs uh, when you try to store too much information in an integer. So this is actually defined by the C standard. So this is allowed. So if you, if you pass in 2 to 31 minus 1 is the largest value that an integer can, occur, uh, can, can contain. So if, you, if, you, if your integer contains that value, you add one to it, you'll get zero. We'll wrap around. This is, uh, this is defined behavior, the wrapping around. It, it's, uh, but it can cause buffer overflows as well. So let's say um, you have your program and you read in the, the, the amount of data that you want to use and you'll make sure that you have enough, in, uh, that, you'll, that, that you'll have enough um, memory allocated to make sure that you cannot overflow it. So the attacker can specify the size and you'll add one to it so that uh, you can add the zero byte at the end and uh, you want to make sure that an attacker cannot overflow it. Of course, in this case, if an attacker enters 2 to 31, so 4 billion and a bit, uh, as, uh, as argument here, um, if you add one to it, you'll malloc zero actually. And a malloc zero is implementation defined. So uh, the malloc can either return null uh, but in most cases, it'll allocate the smallest possible chunk, which is eight, byte lar eight, byte, eight bytes large, because it contains the because uh, it contains the, 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 the size of previous chunk, size of current chunk, and so on. Uh, so yes, it'll, it'll return the, the smallest possible chunk, eight bytes. But you 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 expect to have a chunk which is four billion bytes large. So when you try to write to it, you'll you'll gladly overflow it, and you'll have an uh, you'll have an overflow. These are very hard to spot because they're, they're allowed behavior. An integer overflow is, is, is expected behavior in a C program. So it's, it's very hard to, to spot this in a program. Now, an integer sinus error is related to this. Uh, in this case, a value is interpreted as both signed and unsigned. So let, again, let's say you, you read in a size from, from, from the user, but you want to make sure that it's less than, than the size of the buffer you've defined here. So you check, is A smaller than 100? Yes. Okay, then, then I can just do the string copy and everything's fine. This isn't the case because A here was unsigned. So if the attacker enters a, a negative A, this will, 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 will hold because A is smaller than 100 because it's negative. But string copy expects an unsigned value as its last argument. So it'll convert the, sign, the, the, the negative number to a large positive number, and uh, you'll have an, an overflow again. Uh, so yeah, um, integer errors usually result in, uh, in, in overflows uh, in this case, and they're very hard to spot because uh, casting from an, a signed integer to an unsigned integer is also allowed behavior and, and, and is done uh, without warnings or anything, it'll, it, it's just silently cast. Uh, maybe if you use specific flags, but in Can most cases... Okay, so that makes it slightly easier to, to, to find, but... Uh, so. We've, we've seen a bunch of, of, uh, of errors now. Uh, so how, how, how can we protect against this? Uh, how, have, how have operating systems added protection against this? Uh, so 
that's, that's what we'll look at now. So mitigations or countermeasures. So um, we've divided them into a number of uh, categories. So we have probabilistic countermeasures, um, separation and replication, paging based, bound checkers and verification. Um, it's 10.30 that I have to stop or? Yeah, okay, so I might have to skip over a couple of these because uh, I'm going way too slow. Uh, although, yeah. So let's look at uh, um, yeah, so mostly, mostly these, these mitigations have academic sources, uh, but uh, we'll see how, they are, how, how and if they're applied in, in modern operating system and compilers. So, so some of them have been uh, implemented in Linux versions in Windows 8, Windows 7, and so on. And we'll, we'll discuss the general shortcomings with the, with the approaches and uh, so, so, so the major issues, but sometimes we'll look at operating specific issues, uh, operating system specific issues and, and, and how they were implemented. So uh, probabilistic countermeasures are based on randomness. Uh, these are the most popular these days and they're based on, um, they, they assume that the, memory, that the memory remains secret and they add some, some randomness into it, which makes it much harder to exploit. So the first approach that we'll look, like, look at is the canary-based approach. What we'll do, what, what, the, um, what the compiler does here, it, it, it adds a random number before the return address or in a, in a anywhere, and it'll check that random number before uh, performing an action. If the random number has changed, an overflow has occurred. Uh, because you've overwritten it uh, and, and it was right under the, the value you wanted to protect and so um, we'll have a problem. So uh, the most famous example of this is uh, StackArt, um, which was a, an academic paper released in 1999 and what it did was it placed a random number before return address when entering a function and it checked it when, when, when exiting a function. Uh, so you have a copy of the random number somewhere in global memory, you have it here you place it everywhere before the return address and as long as it remains secret an attacker can't overwrite it because he can't put it back he can't overwrite the return address and put the value back because he doesn't know what it is that's the main idea here so if it if it's changed uh, you terminate the program rather than using the return address so this is what it looks like so we have our function f0 which calls f1 and here's our, our stack layout so uh, F0 has return address, same frame pointer, and right under the same frame pointer we have our canary, local variables, arguments for F1, return address, say frame pointer for F1. Our canary is here. We have a pointer to data, and we have our buffer here. So if an attacker tries to overwrite up to here, that will change the canary, so he can't do that. So when, uh, when, because when the function returns, the canary will be checked before using the return address, so it will terminate the program. So this will not work. Um, okay, so one problem here though. Sorry, yeah? Maybe you were touching on it. So uh, in stack card, the canary is in front of the return address, but it's behind the frame point. They, they, when in their initial release, yes. Uh, somebody on Bugtrack found a way to, to modify the, the safe frame pointer, so their next version update, they, 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 they put it a bit lower. So the original paper, it still says uh, uh, below the return address, but in their actual implementation, which they released, uh, sorry? Yes, so, so in Stagart, in Stagart uh, so this was actually still in Stagart that they moved it. So, so it was here at first, but then somebody said, I can overwrite this frame pointer, move the frame, uh, the entire frame somewhere else and then they bypassed it so and then in the next version they did this and then in Propolis they, they fixed uh, the next problem. So we saw earlier indirect pointer overwriting because we couldn't overwrite the safe frame pointer in this case. So this was actually the canary that we couldn't overwrite. So to bypass this what attackers did was uh, they overwrote the, they, they overflow the buffer, they, make, they overflow the pointer and make that pointer the return address and they've bypassed, uh, bypassed it without overwriting the canary. So this was a problem. So um, Propolis, which was, uh, which was a, a, an iteration by, by, by some people from uh, IBM Research, uh, had the same principle as, uh, as StackArt, but what they did was they reordered the stack frame. 
So all arrays are stored before all, all other data on the stack. And so that way you can only overflow, overflow arrays with each other, but you can't overflow the return address. So this is part of um, GCC 4.1 and Stack Cookies in Visual Studio. So this is what our stack frame looks like now. So although buffer is declared after pointer, the pointer is stored below buffer. So buffer is right next to the canary, so you can't overflow anything without modifying the canary. So this protects against, uh, against uh, indirect pointer overwriting. Um, SAC cookies, so which Microsoft implemented based on, uh, on Propolis, use a similar approach, except instead of terminating the program, what they do when, uh, when they reach an error is they throw an exception. Now, exception handlers are also stored on the stack. So what, it, what attackers would do is they would just keep on overflowing. So not just the return address, they would just, the, the uh, exception handlers are at the top of the stack. So they would overflow the entire stack, overflow the, the exception handlers, and then just wait for the exception to occur. And it would execute their code, which is kind of an easy way to bypass this. So they had two approaches to, to try and fix this. Uh, so what they would do is they would create a table of, uh, of exception handling pointers at link time and only those pointers could be loaded. So if it's not in that table, the exception shouldn't be there and the program would terminate. The problem with this approach is uh, that it required relinking because you had to de decide what the uh, uh, exception handlers would be at link time. So, so that wasn't uh, all that good for, for uh, Microsoft didn't, f didn't find that all that handy that you had to, to relink your program to get the protection. So they also added uh, SC hop, which verifies the integrity of the structure, the exception handler uh, call chain. So, so what it does is, uh, is this. So the exception handler in call chain is a, is a structure with a next pointer and a pointer to the handle. So when you, when you execute uh, uh, an exception, you have the first function that which, which, which handles it and then you have next functions and so on, so you can have multiple exception handlers for, for, for one exception. So what they do is they add, a, um, they add a, a, what they call a symbolic registration records at the end. So as the last one here, uh, they, they add, one, they, they add a, a kind of canary value as well. And so as an attacker, and, and before, you, you, before executing the exception, in the exception handler, they'll, ver they'll verify that the entire call chain is correct. So as, uh, based on ASLR, which we'll discuss in a section, the attacker does not know where the next value for the, for the uh, symbolic record is. So he'll have to point it to somewhere invalid and then his handlers to a shell code. But because he doesn't know where the next value is, he can't, he can't get it to execute uh, his, uh, his injected code because the, this, this will be invalid before executing the uh, exception handler. But if he knows the address, he's going to show us. Does that mean he has broken the SLR? Yes, in, in a sense, uh, it, could also be a, it could also be using a heap based buffer, uh, sorry, um, heap spray. So in the sense that he fills memory with, uh, with a lot of data, which we'll see in a second as a way to bypass ASLR but he still wouldn't be able to, to get this correctly because he wouldn't know the actual value. So, so you can fill the memory with, um, with, with shellcode to execute, but not with, uh, not with this valid uh, value. I'm going to skip these two. They're basically the same idea, but applied to heap, uh, to heap memory. Uh, so one of the problems with canaries is that uh, a random value can leak. Uh, what's to say that a program which suffers from buffer overflows does not suffer from uh, buffer overreads or, or format string vulnerabilities where you're printing out the, the, the values on the, on the stack with percentage X. So um, yeah, for SACGuard, the problem was indirect pointer overwriting. Propolis actually also has some issues uh, in that sense. Uh, an array of characters could be used to uh, overwrite an array of pointers and things like that because all pointers, uh, all arrays are next to each other. Now, uh, they also, the ones we saw uh, specifically rely on one global random value. If you leak that, you can bypass the entire protection. So, um, another protection is, uh, is based on obfuscation of memory addresses. So, um, what it does here in this case is, uh, 
it'll encrypt the memory location uh, while it's in memory. So for example, uh, you can XOR it. So when you, store some, when you store a pointer in memory, you XOR it with, uh, with a, a secret value. And so it'll be C in memory. And when you, try to, when you want to use it again, you'll XOR it again. Uh, and then it, basically what you do is as long as it's in memory, it's xor with B. But when you load it into a register, you'll XOR it with B again. So you have the correct value in the register. And then you'll use that register to access memory. And the idea is that, uh, that the attacker can't modify the register. The, the value in the register without having code execution. So point guard is a typical example of this. Uh, it, so it protects uh, all pointers by encrypting them with the XOR value. It stores the decryption key in a register and it'll decrypt the pointer when it's loaded into the register and encrypted when loaded into memory. And it'll force all co the compiler to do all memory accesses via the registers, by the registers. Now if, the, if a key or a pointer value leaks, you can bypass it because you can figure out what the key is based on the pointer, on the pointer's original value, or you can base, so, so you can, uh, you can uh, bypass it that way. Another interesting attack is uh, a partial overwrite, actually. So the problem with uh, is XOR is that it's a, it's a bitwise uh, operation. So this, XOR this, gives you this, but 44 XOR 50 also gives you 14. So if your injected code is relatively close to the value that you're overwriting, you might only have to overwrite the last byte. Uh, and so that only gives you 256 possibilities there uh, because it'll still be uh, decrypted correctly because these first three, three bytes will, will, will still be the correct ones in the, in the register. But these last, the, the last two ones are the ones you're looking for. So you might only need 256 tries to get a correct value. And if you're overwriting two bytes, it becomes uh, 64K. So um, an example of this partial overwrite is here. So you have your buffer here. You have your encrypted pointer, which is PTR, which points to data, and, and so on, and the rest of the typical stack layout. So instead of overwriting, so our pointer was pointing to data. We know that it's close to our return address because it's on the stack. So we can just modify the last par part of our pointer uh, so we overwrite the last byte and make it point to our return address. So in this case, we only need 256 tries rather than uh, ra rather than than than, uh, than than four billion, which was originally thought when when, when this uh, mitigation was released. So yeah, then we do our indirect pointer overwrite and we have our our shell code. Uh, another important mitigation, which is uh, basically in all modern operating systems these days, is address space layout randomization. So what this does is uh, compiler generates position-independent code, which means it can be loaded anywhere in memory. Uh, and then it randomizes the base addresses of the stack, the heap, uh, and code, and shared memory addresses. And that makes it very hard for an attacker to know where his, his injected shell code is, because normally uh, he needs to know where this is to make the return address point to it. But in this case, he doesn't, uh, because uh, it's, it's because there's a, a random value added to the base address. And every time the program starts, it changes. Um, so yeah, this, um, of course, if you can print out memory locations, you can figure out what the base address was based on the relative locations, and you can bypass it. Uh, yeah, Windows 8 has some extra, extra uh, advances in this, but it was first implemented for Windows in Windows Vista and for Linux in 2.6.12 uh, by default. So heap spraying, which is a technique to bypass ASLR that we mentioned earlier for a second. Uh, so what happens in this case is uh, an attacker can control memory allocation of the program. Let's say, for example, you have a buffer overflow in your browser uh, and it's loading a web page. You, you have JavaScript, which you can use to mem uh, allocate memory. So what you do is you allocate a bunch of memory. So let's say you, exam you, you, you allocate one gigabyte of memory and you fill that memory with knobs and place your shellcode at the end. Now, your randomization will be severely decreased because uh, you have your, your start of the heap, which is added plus random. But if you're high enough in the, up in the heap and, and you have a, a gigabyte of, of possible locations that you can jump to, anyone is fine. You can bypass uh, ASLR that way because uh, it doesn't matter what the offset is exactly. If you say uh, one gigabyte from here, from wherever, 
it's probably somewhere in my knobs. That's fine because you'll have you'll have your memory filled with knobs, uh, and it'll eventually execute your 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 shell code. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Oh, I'm going to have to skip a lot more. Um, so a virtual table guard, which is uh, used by, um, which is implemented in, in, in IE10. So it's actually in, in Visual Studio, but uh, IE10 uses it. So what it'll do is, is uh, it'll protect against a virtual table function, over, function pointer overrides, again, with a random number. So it'll, it'll have a random value there at the top, and it'll check if it's, uh, if it's not changed before using that. This might slow down a bit, so they only uh, enabled it for a number of key classes in IE10. So the problem with probabilistic countermeasures is that they rely on me keeping memory secret. Uh, and so programs that have buffer overflows could also have information leakage problems. So for example, uh, if you have a printf here, so you have a SGRN copy here of exactly 100 bytes, but you're not null terminating the SGRN copy. So the problem with this function is that if you don't null terminate this, uh, it'll just keep on reading. Uh, so in this case, it'll print out anything above buffer until it reaches an all byte. Which, uh, which can result in, in, in printing out the, the secret values. So this can uh, result in bypassing, uh, bypassing this. All right, um, I'm going to skip a number of these. So uh, there's some mitigations which rely on separation and replication. So what they do is they copy information to other memory locations or they separate it out to make it harder for an attacker to, to overwrite these locations. Um, they're not as popular in modern operating systems, so that's why I, I figured I can skip them. Uh, Paging-based <coughs> mitigations are, are interesting in the sense that uh, they're, they're implemented in, in most uh, architectures these days. So what we have is uh, a typical one is, is non-executable memory, uh, sometimes called NX, sometimes called XN, depending on the architecture. So what it does here is that uh, memory can be, uh, in, in a normal uh, in normal architecture, memory can be uh, executable, writable, or readable. Uh, older Intel processors actually didn't uh, implement the, the executable bit. If it was readable, it was always executable, uh, which is kind of a problem. But uh, they, they eventually uh, added the extra bit and allowing, allowing the OS to mark things as non-executable. So for example, you can mark the stack as non-executable, which means you can't inject your code there. Uh, and for example, OpenBSD takes this much further than other operating systems in the sense that uh, they have W, X, or X, which means it's either writable or executable, but never both. Now, programs doing just-in-time compiling have memory that's both executable and writable, so they might have to uh, do some extra processing, which might slow it down a bit. So, so in that sense, uh, this might, might be a problem. So if you have a stack-based bu buffer flow in this case, uh, if you point your return address to injected code, this stack is non-executable, so this code will not execute. So a typical way of bypassing this in early exploits would be to return to existing functions. This was called returning to libc to bypass these countermeasures. So instead of um, executing your shell code, you would execute, let's say, the system function. So you would, would place arguments for the function on the stack, and then kind of jump to that function via the return address. So for example, if you want to call system bin bash, you would place bin bash on the stack and then have your return address return to the system system function, system system call. So this is, uh, this is an example of this. Uh, so we have our typical stack layout and then uh, we'll have overwritten our return address. We'll point it to system and then uh, that system function call expects a pointer to, to a string on the, uh, somewhere. So we'll have a pointer to our string here, and then we'll have our string here. So basically, we've overwritten all this, and this kind of acts like a, like a, like a function call, and it has its, its arguments right, right above it. And so we'll have bypass non-executable memory, but by, by executing existing code. Uh, Return-oriented programming is, is more generic than returning to libc. So, so originally, we could only execute uh, existing functions. But what people saw was that you could actually uh, execute anything as long as you do a, a ret right after it. So you can look through memory for, for code snippets, which do what you want, 
and then do a RET. And you can chain them together to get full functionality, uh, Turing completeness, uh, actually. So in, in libc, they, can find, they, they found a bunch of snippets where they can jump to and that does a return and executes, uh, uh, executes what they want. So for example, if you need something to do a pop e EAX followed by a RET, you look for that. And then the next the one does move, that moves EAX into ECX, does a RET, and the final one jumps to ECX. So let's say you, you, you were able to get your, um, your, your the, the, the pointer you want to write into EAX, and then you need these, these ones to, to, get, uh, to get that into, yeah, to get that executed. So you have your overwritten return address here. It, go, it does pop EAX RET. So this is the value which is supposed to be put in EAX because pop reads from the stack. So after the pop, this ret executes. This one jumps here. It does the mall and then returns, which is the return address here, which then returns here to the jump. And then you, you kind of have your code here. So that way you can get full program uh, execution, uh, full, full functionality that you, you had before by using existing code snippets. Uh, what, what's also interesting here is uh, uh, return er in return-oriented programming is that, for example, on x86 you have a variable number of, uh, of, of, of variable length for instructions. So an instruction can be one byte, so for example in the case of pop, or it can be 17 bytes for the longest one. Uh, the idea behind this is that Rob doesn't have to jump into the beginning of an instruction. It can jump into the middle of an instruction as long as it does what we want it to. Uh, so the middle of an instruction can be uh, interpreted completely differently. Uh, and that can also result in subsequent instructions to be interpreted differently. Here's an example. Um, so we have MOV, uh, EBP minus 44, and we move one into that. So this is what the machine code looks like. Then we have a test EDI, so we check if EDI is equal to seven. And then if, uh, if it's not zero, uh, we'll set this byte at EBP minus 61 to, uh, to 1. Um, so this is the machine code for this. So if you look at the pretty colors, uh, so 00, 0 F7, so if we jump here, we can actually get that to be interpreted as add B, BHDH. We can have, um, and then this will be interpreted, so these bytes will be interpreted as, as, uh, as moving uh, 0 X0 0 F, zeros into EDI, exchange of EAX and EBP, ink of EBP, and a RET. So in this case, we've, we've taken existing code and, and, and interpreted differently, followed by a RET, which allows us to continue. Um, so one of the problems with heap spraying is that, that it won't work with uh, um, non-executable non -executable memory, as we saw earlier, which, which, which can uh, cause issues when you have both ASLR and non-executable memory. The idea here is that you use uh, JIT spraying, which transforms uh, just in time, which uses a just in time compiler to transform code into, into executable machine code. So you could get uh, the, by carefully script, uh, crafting your script, you could jump into the middle of that script and cause it to be interpreted differently when you execute your buffer overflow. So you can fill your memory with this code, which can bypass uh, ASLR and NX. Um, so um, verification countermeasures. So there's also bound checkers, which make sure that you do not go out of bounds with uh, with your with your with your uh, with your buffers. The the main usage of this uh, the the main problem that C has is that you have to do it for pointers, which can be fairly expensive, and most bound checkers. Uh, have, have a significant uh, performance overhead, so they're not often used in practice. So verification countermeasures uh, make sure that the values that are being used are sane. So for example, uh, a typical one here is uh, safe unlinking. Uh, what it does here is that it'll check if your, uh, if your forward pointer, its backward pointer is equal to your actual chunk that, your point, that, that, that you have. And if your backward pointer's forward pointer is also equal to the, to, to the chunk that you started off at. If both conditions hold, then you're fine because then you can't actually have the, the overflow that we were talking about earlier and you can do the unlink. If they don't, then, 
then you just abort the program because something weird has happened in your memory allocator. So most memory allocators implement something like this. Now in Linux, for example, they do. Um, I'm going to skip to the conclusion now. So um, countermeasures exist in, uh, uh, have been widely deployed in modern operating systems these days. Um, so ASLR, StackGuard, safe unlinking, and uh, non-executable memory are all present in, in, in every major operating system out there, even mobile. Um, they've made uh, exploitation significantly harder, uh, but attackers, of course, have found various ways to bypass them, as we saw earlier, via heap spraying, JIT spraying, and so on. Um, Windows 8 specifically has, has done significant improvements on, on mitigations. Uh, so they have a much higher entropy for, for ASLR. So on 64-bit systems, it makes it much harder to guess, uh, to guess a random number. They have the force ASLR. Um, and yeah, that's the main, uh, those are the main uh, issues, the, the main upgrades. Um, so yeah, many attacks exist. We're still looking for, for fast, good, and performant uh, uh, mitigations. And here are some, some papers and presentations with, uh, with more information. So specifically on Windows 8, uh, this was a Black Hat presentation, and these are uh, papers uh, that you can, I think they're, they're all hosted on the SecAppDev website, which is linked to this talk, uh, which you can look at. So in the next session, uh, uh, we'll look at, uh, at how to exploit these kind of vulnerabilities specifically for, uh, for Linux, so we have a VM where we have uh, Linux installed and, and, and we'll try and exploit these over the next uh, 180 minutes. <laughs>